Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Kravis, Physician Executive for 3M Consulting Services. Thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about ICD-10 documentation for emergency medicine and trauma. There are some changes you will need to make in your documentation to support ICD-10, but there are instances of documentation that can remain the same. So let's get started. Preparing for ICD-10 today will facilitate documentation when that next major trauma case is brought in. I know you are busy in your clinical practice, so I will briefly summarize the key takeaways. In your documentation of patient care, consider the use of adjectives. Link the cause and effect of each condition. Be specific about aspects of a disease and each anatomical site and use exact dates when appropriate. A little more on each of these. Differentiate in your notes whether or not a condition is acute, chronic, or acute on chronic whenever appropriate. For example, acute, recurrent, non-suppurative serous otitis media. Use due to or secondary to to indicate cause and effect. For example, vomiting due to gastroenteritis, back pain due to lumbar disc degeneration, or chest pain due to GERD. Think about the most current terminology to describe a condition or different aspects of the disease. For example, zone one minimally displaced sacral fracture. Precisely designate anatomical site such as fracture of the greater trochanter of right femur. Ask yourself, what else could I add in my notes about this patient's condition that would better communicate how sick the patient is, which in turn better communicates the resources needed for patient care? Incorporating these aspects into your documentation will result in an accurate picture of your patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality and outcomes. And it will help reduce the number of queries you receive to clarify your documentation. In the upcoming slides, we'll take a look at some diseases and procedures that have new documentation requirements under ICD-10. In ICD-10, there is a feature called laterality for right, left, and bilateral, which is found in many diagnoses and procedure codes involving paired organs or those codes specific to one side of the body versus the other. For example, acute left otitis media. ICD-9 has a limited number of these. ICD-10 has many more. This feature of ICD-10 by itself is responsible for a substantial increase in the number of codes which you have probably heard so much about. Since you usually include this information in your patient care notes, additional documentation will typically not be needed. So for your information, if you happen to omit laterality when needed, it may result in a query. Suffice it to say, Laterality is included when appropriate for some conditions you may treat, for example, pressure ulcer of the left ankle. So do a quick double check of your notes to be sure you included it before signing off. We'll try not to belabor this point in the upcoming slides. What stays the same? The etiology of cerebral infarction or stroke is still classified primarily by whether it is due to thrombosis or embolism. What's new? ICD-10 has lots of new codes for cerebral infarction which identify the specific artery involved and when applicable, whether right or left. For example, you see here the codes for cerebral infarction due to thrombosis of the anterior cerebral artery. Keep in mind, coders can't get the details of the etiology, site, or laterality from ancillary services reports 
such as radiology, since coding must be based on what you document. So be sure to include these details in your notes. Also new is that ICD-10 provides codes for a cerebral infarction that occurs intraoperatively or postoperatively during cardiac surgery or another type of surgery. It's important to make sure your documentation clearly indicates at which point in time the infarction occurred. Not much new here, but I wanted to take this opportunity to point out that your diagnosis of TIA results in the reporting of an unspecified code as it did in ICD-9. In ICD-10, that code is G45.9. If known or suspected, document the etiology of the patient's symptoms, such as vertebrobasilar artery syndrome or carotid artery syndrome. As with cerebral infarction, Additional documentation that will be needed for patients with non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is the artery affected, as seen here on the left. Documentation of sites other than artery, such as parietal, results in a query or the reporting of a code that states unspecified intracranial artery. As seen here on the right, Non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage requires documentation of the portion of the brain affected, such as the subcortical or cortical hemisphere. As you can see here, ICD-10 provides different codes for a non-traumatic subdural hemorrhage specified as acute, subacute, or chronic. Once again, ICD-10 allows you to report how sick your patient is through the reporting of acuity, so be sure to differentiate the type in your notes. Also note, code I62.1 is reported for non-traumatic extradural hemorrhage when documented. Unique ICD-10 codes are reported for traumatic brain hemorrhage of the sites you see here when you include this information in your notes. Additionally, you have the capability to report any associated loss of consciousness and how long it lasted. For example, one code is reported for loss of consciousness up to 30 minutes, a different code is reported for up to 59 minutes, and so forth. So include this information in the patient record. ICD-10 provides the ability to report the specific site of the spinal column affected. For cervical and lumbar, you should document the specific vertebral segment affected such as C3 or L3. However, a range can be used for thoracic injuries with the exception of those that occur at T1. Take a moment to review these on the screen. Record a complete diagnosis during each patient encounter. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 continues to classify CAD by native coronary artery or bypass graft, and if the CAD is of a bypass graft, the type of graft. These should already be elements of your documentation. What's different in ICD-10? Combination codes are provided for CAD with and without angina. When your patient has CAD with angina, your documentation of angina should include the type, if other than angina pectoris, such as unstable angina or angina with documented spasm. For example, ICD-10 code I25.710 is reported when you document CAD of saphenous vein bypass graft and unstable angina pectoris. As physicians, we know what the clinical term acute coronary syndrome means, but in ICD-10, acute coronary syndrome is assigned to the nonspecific diagnosis code of acute ischemic heart disease unspecified. If you can describe ACS more specifically as intermediate or insufficiency coronary syndrome, unstable angina, 
or coronary slow flow syndrome. These terms rather than ACS should be documented and will result in codes that give a more accurate picture of what you are treating. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 classifies myocardial infarction by type, STEMI versus non-STEMI. New in ICD-10 is the ability to report the site or location of a STEMI by coronary artery affected. If at the time of diagnosis you don't know the coronary artery, document as much as you do know, such as the wall of heart affected. Note that no additional documentation is needed for the location of non-STEMI. Here are some examples of ICD-10 codes for a STEMI. Note that the codes are first categorized by anterior or inferior wall, then additional specificity is provided for the coronary artery. Also note that certain terms crosswalk to certain codes. For example, a transmural myocardial infarction of the inferior wall is coded to other coronary artery. The key here is describing the MI as specifically as you can regarding the type and location in terms of the artery, wall, or other site affected. Unique ICD-10 codes are used to identify patients who present with an MI that is occurring within four weeks of a previous MI. When a patient is admitted with an MI and the patient has a history of a recent MI, document the date of the recent MI, the type as either STEMI or non-STEMI, and in the case of a STEMI, the wall of the heart that is affected. We see here in this example of medical record documentation that the patient presented with an acute STEMI of the LMCA, and the patient had a history of non-STEMI last month. Improved documentation for ICD-10 includes either the exact date of the previous non-STEMI or the number of weeks since it occurred. ICD-9 provided a single code for cardiac arrest. ICD-10 provides the ability to report the cause of the cardiac arrest when known or suspected as due to an underlying cardiac condition or other condition. Your documentation should indicate a cause and effect relationship by using words such as due to or secondary to. ICD-10 terminology describing congestive heart failure remains essentially unchanged from ICD-9. However, there is currently an opportunity for improvement in documenting this diagnosis. To provide an accurate picture of the patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality, you should specify whether the patient's congestive heart failure is acute, chronic, acute, on chronic, and whether it is systolic, diastolic, or a combination of both. Additionally, you should document the cause or etiology of the congestive heart failure when known or suspected. An example of excellent documentation would be acute systolic heart failure due to possible or suspected alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Classification of pneumonia and pneumonitis is very similar to ICD-9. It continues to be important for you to document the type of pneumonia, for example, aspiration pneumonia, and the organism, such as Klebsiella, when known or suspected. Remember, a coder cannot base code assignment on a sputum culture or cytology report. You must document the organism in your note, indicating a cause and effect relationship, such as Klebsiella pneumonia or pneumonia secondary to or due to Klebsiella. ICD-9 did not differentiate between a diagnosis of respiratory failure and acute respiratory failure. The good news is that ICD-10 does. When appropriate, 
you should document respiratory failure as acute, chronic, or acute on chronic. Additionally, also specify if hypoxia or hypercapnia or both is associated with the respiratory failure. Remember, coders cannot interpret the results of tests such as arterial blood gases. They must rely on your documentation. At times we see respiratory insufficiency and respiratory distress used interchangeably with respiratory failure. Respiratory insufficiency and distress are signs and symptoms of an underlying condition and are coded differently from respiratory failure in ICD-10. Be clear on your intended diagnosis. Severity of illness will not be reported accurately if you use one term when you meet another. Additionally, document the cause or etiology of respiratory failure, such as due to COPD, surgery, or trauma. ICD-10 differentiates COPD with acute lower respiratory tract infection from acute exacerbation of COPD without infection. When an infection is present, document the specific infection and organism when known or suspected. When respiratory failure is present, it should be specified as acute, acute on chronic, or chronic. Dependence on supplemental oxygen should also be indicated when applicable. Classification of asthma is an example of the use of updated terminology in ICD-10. Asthma is now classified as mild intermittent or mild, moderate, or severe persistent. Documentation of acuity remains unchanged from ICD-9. You should continue to document the presence of an acute exacerbation or status asthmaticus. For example, a diagnosis of severe persistent asthma with acute exacerbation is classified to J45.51. As I am sure most of you listening today may be aware, the diagnosis and management of acute otitis media has significant impact on the health of children, cost of providing care, and the overall use of antibiotics. The illness also generates a significant social burden and indirect cost due to time lost from school and work. The more specific we can be in reporting this diagnosis, the better the data will be that is used to quantify the impact on children, costs, burden on the healthcare system in general, and to determine efficacy of treatment. New to ICD-10, is the ability to capture recurrence in acute separative otitis media and acute non-separative otitis media. Take a few minutes to review on screen the types of otitis media that are separately identified in ICD-10 and the additional documentation for each that when provided will result in the reporting of an accurate description of the condition you are treating. Note that the terms you see, such as acute, chronic, recurrent, allergic, and serous, for example, must be documented by you in order to report these specific codes. ICD-10 provides new combination codes to differentiate severe sepsis with or without septic shock. It is important to document septic shock when present in addition to the underlying infection when known, and any associated organ dysfunction such as acute respiratory failure, acute renal failure, acute hepatic failure, and or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Acute organ dysfunction is an important predictor of severity of illness and risk of mortality in the critically ill patient. Should you treat a patient with SIRS due to a non-infectious process such as trauma, be sure to document this.
Documentation of any associated acute organ dysfunction for this patient is also important. Sometimes we use the terms bacteremia, sepsis or septicemia, and severe sepsis interchangeably or indiscriminately in records when in fact these terms are different diagnoses resulting in different codes. Bacteremia describes the presence of bacteria in the blood without symptoms. Sepsis and septicemia describe the patient with symptoms but without associated organ dysfunction. Severe sepsis describes the patient with associated organ dysfunction. Make certain you clearly document the term that accurately describes your patient's condition. This ensures correct reporting of the complexity of your patient's condition. What is new with urinary tract infections is that the diagnosis of urosepsis can no longer be coded in ICD-10. In ICD-9, a diagnosis of urosepsis defaulted to the code for an unspecified urinary tract infection. If you record a diagnosis of urosepsis in the ICD-10 environment, it will generate a query asking you for clarification. If by using the term urosepsis, you mean the patient has a UTI, then document UTI. If you mean the patient has septicemia from a urinary source, make sure to document this. For example, E. coli sepsis due to UTI. There's not a lot new with urinary tract infections in ICD-10. If you know the site of the infection, it's important to note it, such as cystitis, urethritis, or pyelonephritis, and if the condition is acute or chronic. If the infection is related to a device, you must document this relationship, such as UTI due to indwelling Foley catheter. Lastly, if you know the organism causing the infection, make sure to document the cause and effect relationship in your note, such as E. coli UTI. Once again, there is not much new here. Like ICD-9, ICD-10 can classify gastroenteritis due to a variety of causes or organisms when documented. Specify the etiology and or organism when known or suspected. Diagnoses such as gastroenteritis due to norovirus or suspected viral gastroenteritis convey more meaningful information than a diagnosis of gastroenteritis or a list of symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Document as much as you know or suspect about the gastroenteritis at the time of your evaluation. ICD-10 provides several new codes for specific types of pancreatitis, such as idiopathic acute pancreatitis and alcohol-induced acute pancreatitis, while continuing to distinguish between acute and chronic, as was in the case of ICD-9. However, there are continuing opportunities for improvement in the documentation of acute versus chronic pancreatitis and the specific etiology. Let's take a look at some actual medical record documentation on the next slide. We see here in this example of medical record documentation, a final diagnosis of pancreatitis and alcohol abuse. There is no statement of acute versus chronic, and there is no linkage between the pancreatitis and alcohol abuse. The final diagnosis on the right tells a better story. It clearly states the pancreatitis is acute and shows cause and effect by stating due to alcohol dependence, which results in the reporting of alcohol-induced acute pancreatitis. The coder is not permitted to assume 
the alcohol caused the pancreatitis. Only you are able to document and use words such as caused by, due to, or secondary to. Additionally, consider the statement in the history, daily alcohol use. If your intended diagnosis is alcohol dependence, state dependence rather than abuse or use. Dependence and use or abuse are two different codes. ICD-10 codes distinguish between open and closed and displaced and non-displaced fractures. In some cases, unique codes are provided for the specific part of the bone fractured. For example, greater or lesser trochanter of the head of the right femur. Fracture orientation can also be specified, such as green stick, transverse, oblique, or spiral. And of course, right versus left, when applicable, is also a component. So be as precise as possible when recording your diagnosis of fracture. For open fractures of the forearm, femur, and lower leg, you will also need to document type 1, 2, or 3A, 3B, or 3C according to the Gustillo classification. As you know, the Gustillo classification is used to identify the severity of soft tissue damage. Fracture healing, infection, and amputation rates correlate with the degree of soft tissue injury by Gustillo and help determine the prognosis. Physio fractures are reported based on the Salter-Harris classifications of types 1 through types 4. Finally, sacral fractures need the additional description of zone 1, 2, or 3 for vertical fractures and whether minimally or severely displaced. Transverse fractures are reported based on types 1, 2, 3, or 4. ICD-10 differentiates other injuries to the skin and musculoskeletal system by type such as contusion, laceration, dislocation, subluxation, sprain, and strain. In each case, additional detail should be documented for sight and in most cases, laterality. Take for example, a sprain of the ankle. Determine if you can further identify the specific ligament injured, such as calcaneofibular, deltoid, tibiofibular, internal collateral, or talofibular. If so, document sprain of right calcaneofibular ligament of the right ankle, for example, rather than right ankle sprain. In ICD-10, Burns are classified in much the same way as in ICD-9 by anatomic site and depth or degree of burn, that is, first, second, or third degree. Burns of the eye and internal organs are classified by site, but not by depth or degree. What's new in ICD-10? A distinction is made between thermal burns and corrosive burns. Corrosive burns are due to chemicals. Thermal burns are due to a heat source such as flame, hot air, or gases, and electrical heating appliances, among others. To summarize, your documentation of burns should include anatomic site, degree, and cause. Additionally, you should document the percentage of body surface involved with any degree of burn, and of that percentage, how much is third degree. What's new here is that a diagnosis of depression without further qualification is coded to F32.9 in ICD-10, which is the code for major depressive disorder, single episode, unspecified. In ICD-9, a diagnosis of unqualified depression was assigned a code that simply said depression. If major depression is not your intended diagnosis, 
consider adding additional details to your documentation when known. It will change the code and better describe what you are treating. For example, major depression could be further specified as single episode or recurrent. In either case, is it mild, moderate, or severe? If severe, it is with or without psychotic features. Is your intended diagnosis something else other than major depression, such as adjustment disorder, for example, grief reaction, with depression and or anxiety, anxiety depression, or depressive neuroses? According to published Medicare inpatient hospital data, the code for unspecified depression appears on one-fifth of hospital records covered by Medicare. We can do a better job identifying patients with major depressive disorders as compared to those with other forms of depression that are less severe and require less resources. Now we'll take a look at three procedures that may be performed in the emergency department to give you some exposure to ICD-10 PCS codes and associated documentation requirements. Take, for example, suture of a six by two centimeter left supraorbital deep complex facial laceration. Closure was performed of the subcutaneous tissue followed by skin closure. Here you see the table the coder will use to construct the code for this procedure. The first three digits of the code come from here, indicating a repair procedure involving subcutaneous tissue and fascia. It is important for you to note when laceration repairs involve closure of subcutaneous tissue and fascia. Repairs involving skin only are coded using a different table. The next digit of the code captures the specific body part, in this case, the subcutaneous tissue and fascia of the face. The approach was stated as open. No device indicates a device was not left in the body. Devices do not include items such as sutures and drains. The coder will select Z, no qualifier, the resulting code generated by the coder based on the documentation is 0JQ10ZZ. Take for example, incision and drainage of paronychia of the left index finger using an 18 gauge needle. Here you see the table the coder will use to construct the code for this procedure. The first three digits of the code come from here, indicating a drainage procedure involving skin and breast. Since the procedure involves only the skin, this is the table that is selected by the coder rather than the one seen previously for subcutaneous and fascia. The next digit of the code captures the specific body part in this case, the fingernail. The approach is external. No device indicates a device was not left in the body. Finally, without a statement by you of biopsy or indication the procedure was performed for diagnostic purposes, the coder will select Z, no qualifier. The resulting code generated by the coder based on the documentation is 0H9QXZZ. ICD-10 coding of fracture treatment doesn't necessarily require additional documentation from you since you would typically document all elements needed to determine the ICD-10 code. These elements are bone involved, laterality, approach, and type of fixation device, if any. Here is the table the coder will use 
to construct a code for fracture reduction of some of the upper bones. Note that ICD-10 uses the terminology of reposition instead of reduction to describe the procedure. You won't have to change your vocabulary. The coder will know that ICD-10 reposition operations include fracture reduction. For example, the code for closed reduction of a left radial fracture is 0PSJXZZ. ICD-10 requires more detailed descriptions in your documentation of anatomical site and aspects of a disease, condition, procedure, and circumstances of patient encounters. The information generated from ICD-10 codes will result in a more accurate picture of your patients, their severity of illness, risk of mortality, and the services rendered. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality and outcomes. Should you have questions about documentation for a particular diagnosis or procedure, your hospital's clinical documentation improvement specialist should be your first stop. The coding staff in your health information management department is a valuable resource as well. Thanks for joining me and have a great day.